access to U.S. financial markets? Well, th th thank you for the question, and I, I, I certainly agree that the financial component of of, of this whole of this whole effort is is key to its success. Um, I actually was, was pleasantly surprised by how strong the uh, 1929 was on, on the financial side. I think we had got some really, really important provisions in there. Can that you we've, pull the microphone I think we've closer. got some really important provisions in there that we've been looking for for a long time, especially with respect to correspondent banking. And you saw that the EU picked right up on that um, and themselves even went beyond the UN in terms of correspondent banking. So I think it's becoming really just in the past month increasingly difficult for, the, for, for, for Iran to access the international financial system through its correspondent banking networks. Now, uh, the, the issue is, and, and, and that's been reducing over the past three years or so, we've been having a lot of success in banks moving out of their Iran business. Now, the question is, as you raise, what do we do with respect to the few remaining um, that are continuing to do this business? Um, and as we discussed earlier, uh, Congress just gave us very, very important new authority in that. And we, are, uh, we have 90 days, the Treasury Department has 90 days to issue regulations. Uh, uh, that when applied would uh, severely, re uh, severely restrict or cut off um, a third party bank's correspondent relations with the United States um, if it's doing business with a designated entity, uh, a designated Iranian entity. Um, and we have every uh, intention of, uh, of meeting that 90 day deadline of issuing those regulations and we, in we, we intend to implement the law that Congress gave us. So I, our, our hope though is that as banks around the world, um, the few remaining um, see the choice that they have to make, uh, that, it's, uh, that, they're, that, they're, that they're going to make the uh, economically intelligent decision as to, as, as to what to do. Um, that's been a part of our strategic uh, dialogue with the international financial sector for years now, and, 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 and I think that's working. There are some banks, even after that, that aren't exposed to the United States, um, that we, we would have less leverage on, and, and we're going to have to come up with creative ways of dealing with them as well. But this is, this is something that we've been seized with for, for, for a long time, and it, it's really what we see as, as one of our main contributions to the effort um, is, to, uh, uh, is to do precisely what, what, what you're suggesting. Actually, I am aware about the designation process taking too long to complete, and many companies and banks, including fronts and subsidiaries of previously sanctioned entities, going unsanctioned. Uh, for example, um, Arisal, uh, IRISL, Iran's a state shipping company, um, and the process there, because after the U.S. initially sanctioned this company, uh, they, they began to evade it by renaming ships and establishing front companies to take over ownership of the vessels. And last month, more than a year later, the Treasury Department finally updated its sanctions on Arisal. Yet um, even this failed to identify multiple front companies that were identified by the Commerce Department as it related to the transfer of the speedboat from a South African company to an Iranian company last year. So what is going on with this, with actions against these numeral, numerous uh, Arisal front companies, some of which have already been identified by the Commerce Department? Yeah, I, I mean, it, you, you, raise, you raise a very, very important point, and it's a challenge uh, that we face, and we face it, we face it every day. Um, uh, Chairman Towns, in, in his opening remarks, uh, said sanctions can't just be a cat and mouse game. And I think that's, uh, I, I wrote it down when he said it because I thought it was a, a, an, an extremely important point. There's two components to our sanctions regime with respect to Iran and, and with respect to a, a lot of different sanctions regimes we have, but certainly with Iran. There's the targeted side and there's the systemic side. And if they're, both, and if they're not both working, um, especially the systemic side, then it's going to be, it's, you're not going to get the results you're looking for. So. Yes, there's a cat and mouse aspect to it, and that's what, what you're referring to, mm -hmm. which is we, we take an action and then that causes a response and we have to catch up to the response. And if that's the only way we do it, that's not going to be successful uh, because it's much easier to change a company's name uh, than it is to go through a, 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 a procedure that, is, that has due process and fairness in it uh, and, 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 and take a formal government action that has an impact on people. Uh, so that's, that's always going to be an issue. What that has to be combined with is strong systemic protections, uh, obligations on banks and on other private sector entities to themselves uh, be careful, to in themselves understand who they're dealing with, to themselves uh, uh, prevent, prevent themselves from being abused by, by Iranian entities, by Iranian banks, by ERISL. Um, and, that's, and, and that's part of all of this. I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you.
Lukenmeyer. Mr. Lukenmeyer, recognized. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Um, Mr. Anhorn, just uh, quickly, uh, has concerns with regards to just the general activity over the Middle East. It would seem as though uh, with the recent agreement with Syria that Iran has had, the recent testing of the missiles that now I think 1,200 miles is what their reach is, that they've made tremendous progress with regards to developing and uh, putting in place a plan not only to make but also deliver nuclear arms. Where do you, uh, and where, where, where are we at? Um, Congressman, what you, what you just cited is a source of concern to us. Um, it's, it's not just a question of Iran making progress in its centrifuge enrichment program. Uh, it's progress in uh, means of delivering a, po a possible nuclear weapon. And they've been making progress in their missile program, and that's, you know, that's, a, that's a problem. Uh, the new Security Council resolution specifically uh, s uh, prohibits Iran from, uh, from uh, any activities related to ballistic missiles that can carry nuclear weapons. What's the enforcement uh, mechanism, gives us, I mean, that, that gives us leverage. Uh, when we believe there's a shipment uh, to Iran from any country that could support their missile program, uh, we will utilize the inspection provisions of that resolution to try to interdict it. Okay. We have there's, there's another country that may be even more interested in what's going on over there than what we are, and that's Israel. Are we discussing the sanctions with them more than just sending them copies of our newspapers every day? Do we have detailed briefings with the Israeli officials to where they're drawn into these uh, discussions, may, made a part of what's going on so that they're informed and, and can have some input? Because I'm sure they've got as, as good or better intelligence as what's going on than what we have because of the, the, the the dramatic impact it has on them. Um, uh, absolutely, Congressman. We're in close touch uh, with the Israelis. As a matter of fact, uh, this afternoon we have a meeting with a senior Israeli team uh, to talk about Iran and to talk about sanctions. And uh, they are an important source of information. We cooperate on intelligence matters with lots of friendly countries around the world. Uh, but Israeli intelligence is particularly well, where, good. Where, where are we going with our, our relationship with Israel? It seems it's a kind of a cold relationship at this point with this administration. Uh, are we starting to warm up to them a little bit? Are we starting to work with them a little bit more? Because uh, I know they're not very happy, from what I understand, with what, what's been going on. Well, m my impression is that, uh, pre that Prime Minister Netanyahu's uh, recent visit uh, was, was very successful. Uh, we are uh, strengthening the relationship all the time, and I think uh, today's consultations on Iran is, is an example of how closely we can work uh, with the State of Israel. Okay, through this process, is there some sort of uh, retribution or some sort of sanction or some sort of pressure that we're going to be putting on Syria and other countries in the, in the area, just immediate area there besides Russia and China, uh, that are helping the Iranians? Um, uh, Syria is on our uh, list of state sponsors of terrorism. Right. Uh, and there we admit are, that they're terrorists, is that there, right? Th there are many, th well, they're on our list. Okay. Um, and uh, there are many sanctions that apply to Syria for that and other reasons, including, you know, Syria is a big uh, importer of missile technology, which is a problem also. Uh, so uh, we, uh, you know, we, have, we have reached out to Syria. We're trying to explore whether there's the basis for some meaningful dialogue, uh, but we do so without uh, any illusions uh, about the nature of the regime and uh, about some of its ambitions uh, in the area of weapons of mass destruction. Okay. With that, uh, Madam Chairman, I yield the balance of my time to uh, Mr. Burton. Yes, if, I just want to make a real brief comment. I know the four of you have a great responsibility because of the legislation we passed. Uh, and I know Mr. Flake and others have indicated that maybe, you know, uh, these sanctions won't work. But I would just like to say that those who are aware of history realize that this may be one of the last chances we have to stop Iran from getting nuclear weapons. And I'd like to remind you and everybody else that what happened back in the late 1930s led to 50-some million people being killed because we didn't do everything necessary to stop the Luftwaffe on Hitler and everything else. And I think Mr. Ahmadinejad is one that, that can be equated with uh, possibly Hitler. And I think it's very important that we do everything possible to stop them with their nuclear programs so we don't have to face that prospect. And with that, I thank the gentleman for yielding.
Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. And I'm going to plead in advance with the panelists. Thank you for being here. You need to speak into the mic like this. Otherwise, you cannot be heard. You sound muffled, and I missed much of your testimony. So please, the acoustics are terrible here. Um, we're going to fix that, though. Uh, Washington Post, Mr. Einhorn, had a uh, story last week about self-pars and how sanctions may actually be having the intended effect, uh, although the Chinese and the Malaysians are trying to pick up some of the slack. Are there, uh, do you, would you agree with that assessment? And are there other uh, salient examples of where we can point concretely and say that's, that's because of sanctions? Um, I think it's accurate. I, th I do think it's accurate. I think uh, the Iranians are having some difficulty getting investment in some of the big projects, including South Pars. Uh, Danny Glazer you know, talked about Khatam al uh, withdrawing from that uh, project. Um, uh, uh, I mentioned in my testimony uh, major oil companies um, that have pulled back from their, uh, uh, their interest in Iran. Uh, so I do believe that these sanctions are having the desired effect of discouraging investment in, uh, in Iran's petroleum sector. Um, you mentioned, speaking of China, that, uh, uh, you've, uh, that the State Department has elevated this to the highest level and it's now a topic of conversation when we have diplomatic discussions. Um, what's, what's the nature of the representation? What's the nature of the response? Well, we invested a lot of uh, diplomatic time and effort on the European Union's recent decision at every level of government. A number of us traveled uh, to Europe and sp spoke to Europeans. Uh, Danny Glazier's boss, Stuart Levy, uh, played an important role in this. Secretary Clinton has been very active on the telephone and in her meetings. Vice President Biden, Secre uh, President Obama, all of them have put a lot of effort into making uh, these sanctions work and generating pressure uh, that can lead to a change in Iran's behavior. Yeah, but I mean, you're not giving us any reassurance that the Chinese care or are receptive to your message. In fact, there's, there's some evidence they don't. Yeah. Um, I, I mentioned before that after China's yes vote, which was a good thing, uh, uh, China remains um, a matter of concern, and uh, this is China uh, is going to be the focus of very high level attention over the next uh, weeks and months. But China is an important part of this, needs to be an important part of this international effort to put pressure on Iran. Um, well, uh, Mr. Glazer, um, the uh, March GAO report. Uh, on enforcing restrictions, said that it recommended that the Department of Treasury uh, should be in, uh, ensuring that uh, uh, they're developing a capability to provide all other federal agencies that are relevant and Congress with complete and timely information concerning all licenses issued for the export of goods to Iran. What progress have we achieved on that recommendation in the Treasury Department? I, I believe that was a, a recommendation made to an uh, office of the Treasury Department called the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Can um, I tell you I cannot hear you, Mr. Glazer? I'm, I'm sorry. I apologize, Mr. Congressman. Uh, that, that recommendation, I believe, was made to a portion of the Treasury Department called the Office of Foreign Assets Control. Um, so I'll, I'll, have to take that, I'll have to take that question back to them, and we could provide you an answer. Would you get back to us for the record, please? Absolutely. Thank you. Um, let me ask, uh, UN Security Resolution 1540 obligates UN member states to develop and enforce measures to prevent the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. Uh, to non-state actors. Presumably that resolution has direct relevance to Iran, even though it's not called Iran sanctions, but it certainly uh, has direct relevance. Uh, have we been able to use that resolution in our, in our diplomatic efforts to uh, ensure compliance with Iran sanctions and or to encourage others to sort of try to see this issue our way? Mr. Einhorn. Uh, Congressman, uh, uh, 1540 may be an indirect way of addressing the, the question of Iran. Uh, it's basically been seen as a vehicle for strengthening the capacity of lots of countries around the world uh, to, uh, to cope with the threat of terrorism, the threat from non-state 
actors. Uh, Iran is a sponsor, uh, is a state sponsor of terrorism. It has given support uh, to a number of terrorist organizations. Uh, we need the, to increase the ability of countries uh, to, to cope with that threat, whether coming from Iran or other uh, terrorists. Thank, Thank you. you. The gentleman's time, time has expired. My time has expired. Thank Mr. you, Madam Mr. Chair. Issa. Thank you, Madam Chair. Mr. Christoph, in addition to the 41 companies and all the other research you did in your April report, uh, you have also, I assume, observed uh, one of the subjects has talked about a lot, the gasoline that has to be imported into Iran. Is that not so? Yes, in fact, uh, uh, Mr. Issa, we are planning on issuing a report next week as soon as we get all comments from a variety of companies that we have identified in open sources as selling refined petroleum products, particularly gasoline, to Iran. And without asking you to get ahead of your own report, uh, for all practical purposes, Iran's not suffering. They're getting that 145,000 or so uh, barrels of gaso uh, gasoline and petroleum products they need, right? Well, the the spot market is such that it's a very fungible product, and you can get the product, even though the cost might be in additional cost to get the product. You can still get the product. So, bottom line is, at least that part of the sanction not so good. Well, you it's know, just as long started. as they have money, they get the they get the fuel. Well, I think it's just started. I mean, the, these new sanctions were just imposed this week, in which the State Department would have to begin identifying companies and starting to enforce sanctions against those who, in fact, do sell refined petroleum products to Iran. But we leaned on Kazakhstan a long time ago, a country that could uh, deliver the refined petroleum quicker, cheaper, easier, because it they're they're in the closest proximity to the. Uh, uh, to Tehran, which is where the ultimate shortage is. It, the shortage is in the north, not the south. Uh, and it didn't help that they didn't supply it. They still got it over this period leading up to uh, this week. Is that right? They need 140,000 barrels of gasoline every day. That's their domestic shortage. Uh, according to even Intel sources, they are working to try to increase their refining capacity, but they're still going to be dependent upon imports. Okay. Well, you know, Iraq was the same way, and they simply uh, built a pipeline in addition to all the other leakage, shipped oil to Syria, Syria refined it, took a big cut and sent a certain amount back, and it wasn't until after we took Baghdad and bombed that uh, pipeline that we actually stopped it. Uh, Mr. We Einhorn, that takes me back, if you will. You have been on the ground since, uh, and, and working in this one unique area since Nixon. Is that true? Um. That is right. Not in the specific area, but it, I began government service in 72. And you have been in more or less in nonproliferation and related subjects for most, much of that time. That, that's correct. So when you began, there were five countries that had nukes, right? The Gang of Five? Uh, roughly. Roughly. Roughly five. But it was, you know, in my recollection as a, as a, as a young, younger man, it wasn't India. It wasn't Pakistan, it wasn't Israel, it wasn't North Korea, and it wasn't Iran. It was the U.S., the Soviet Union, China, the U.K., and France. Pretty much right? Those were the acknowledged uh, nuclear weapon states. Right. I realize that there was declared, undeclared. But, uh, and I realize if Japan wanted a nuclear weapon, it could probably.